Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. <coughs> My name is Fred Varko. I'm co-chair of the Professional Activities Committee here, and we're very pleased today to have uh, Mr. Lance Gatling to speak with us. As we know, North Korea is one of the uh, topics of the moment, and they've been sending missiles over Japan into the Pacific Ocean. And there's been a lot of scaremongering in the media, not from Japan, I'm sure, about what their capabilities are, what they can do. Supposedly, they can hit 48 states in continental US. Uh, but nobody really has put any uh, concrete facts on the, on the floor. And hopefully, Lance will be able to do that. Uh, before we go any further, can I ask you to turn your telephones off? or put them on vibrate. Uh, Lance Gatling is a descendant of the inventor of the Gatling gun and has spent most of his life in, uh, in the military or with uh, dealing with defense systems. He's currently president of Nexial Research Incorporated. He's a defense analyst and he has degrees from West Point and the US Naval Postgraduate School. He's been in Japan, like many of us, forever. And he knows a thing or two about uh, missiles and weapon systems. So before uh, we go any further, please welcome Mr. Lance Gatling. OK, thank you, Fred. And uh, th thanks to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan for the opportunity to speak today. I hope uh, to be able to give you something, uh, a bit of food for th thought about what is a, a topic that uh, is really difficult to uh, grasp as, as an outsider for someone who doesn't do these things regularly. Um, it's, it's really kind of outside the, um, the, the ken of human experience to, to talk about these things that go so far so fast, if they work, if they work at all. Uh, a friend of mine, an associate, business associate, who still works in the industry, he was an engineer for NASA, and he said, no one is surprised when a rocket fails to uh, lift off and work as planned. Everyone is surprised when it does. Um, and, and there's reasons for that. This is a really hard thing. Uh, if, you, if you were to posit the existence of God, rocket science is one of the things where God just has a great sense of humor. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to get to orbit with, with a single stage. People have been uh, trying this for, for decades, for 100 years. That's been the dream. Go to, go to orbit, get up into outer space with a single stage rocket and stay there. You can go into space with a single, single stage rocket, but you fall back down to Earth. And when that happens, it's following what's called a ballistic trajectory. So many of the popular terms used to describe shooting down m missiles or things like this, they're, they're just completely incorrect because they don't fly like aircraft. And, and we all have the experience, I would ex assume, of flying in an aircraft or moving in a car. Uh, the aircraft has wings, you take a wing off, it's, it starts, it's inside the atmosphere, it stops its forward motion, it falls almost directly to ground as, uh, as they found out with Pan Am and uh, Lockerbie. Um, if you blow open the aircraft, it, it stops to f function as an aircraft. If you take off the engines, it stops to function as, a, as an aircraft and the, and the wind resistance makes it fall to earth. Ballistic missiles don't work that way, they work ballistically. Ballistically meaning if I throw it, uh, the impetus comes and it goes, and I've already broken my first prop. Uh, it, it is on a ballistic path, and that path uh, cannot be interrupted except by a greater energy that put it on that path. Okay, so if you could imagine that my next prop, which I'll try not to break, uh, if this is a water balloon and I threw it at Fred, and someone somehow, if uh, Mr. Raleigh was actually able to penetrate it with a dart halfway through the trajectory, uh, the water would continue to go. So when people talk of uh, um, shooting down uh, missiles, whether they're the President of the United States, uh, the, the Premier of uh, Japan or whatever, it's a common vernacular, it's, it's completely wrong. It's not how it works. <laughs> Okay, so how does it work? How are these things supposed to work? Well, when they work, there's a whole lot of things that have to go into, uh, into it. And I won't go through all of these. 
De but you'd have to develop it, manufacture, deploy it, test it. You have to have command and control. You have to be able to launch it. It has to guide. It has to guide accurately. It has to re-enter. If it leaves the atmosphere, it has to re-enter the atmosphere, and then you have to fuse it and make something happen. Okay, and all of that is to deliver a payload. So a tiny, only a tiny percentage of a of a uh, of a ballistic missile is actually payload. Payload being what it's there to do. Whether it blows something up, deliver Christmas presents, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's only a tiny percentage of the of, of the device. Um, so the North Koreans have had an astounding run of develop of demonstrating some missiles that have been developed uh, peer, clearly at great expense and effort. Now this is a country with the economy of smaller than that of New Hampshire. If you imagine that these these devices take decades in most instances to do. If you look at the Japanese H2 and the, now the new H3 development, it's billions of dollars. Uh, and in fact, the Japanese effort is largely underfunded, and they will have severe problems as they test and everything else, and they'll continue to build on uh, on their past successes. And they don't have anybody tr trying to shoot them down, well, not not shoot them down, engage them. So uh, what are what are we pr primarily talking about? We're talking about a, a number of missiles in, in the Taipei Dong uh, satellite launch, um, essentially uh, demonstrations. They weren't developments; they were demonstrations of capability. Um, the, the, the North Korean missiles look more or less like this. You'll see a, a, a man-sized silhouette. Typically, those are six feet tall, you know, 1.8 meters, whatever. Um, and, and this gives you an idea of the size of it. And they all kind of look the same from the outside. That's a reason. There, there's a functional reason for this. But what those ranges mean, and sorry, these ranges, uh, this left axis is ranges in, um, in thousands of kilometers. Okay, so they're, they're different. These are single stage, two stage, all the way up. Um, up to 10,000 kilometers. That's where the United States gets interested because that's the range from North Korea to Washington, D.C. Okay, so what that looks like if we were hovering over the uh, over the northern Pacific, it looks like this. The Scud ER, this is a very old family of, of missiles. Uh, the, the extended range Scud is essentially a, an improved V2 from the Germans in World War II. Why? That's how the Russians learn how to make these, these devices. And in fact, the United States Army, if you know of Werner von Braun and his friends in, in lower, in LA, lower Alabama, they actually came from the same uh, rocket program. The US got first choice and the Russians scooped up the rest of them. And that's how we all learned to make uh, rockets post-war through these uh, nice Nazi gents who were rocket scientists. And then if you if you have these uh, range rings extending out from Korea, you see that Japan uh, is, lies, most of Japan lies within the range of the Scud ERs. Uh, this is a problem for Japan. It's, it's a problem for U.S. military bases in Japan and, and South Korea. It's not a problem for the homeland, the United States, lower 48 or uh, Alaska. So here's what, a, here's what a rocket essentially looks like. Um, it's taking the prototypical rocket, the German uh, A4, that the Allies call the V2. It's got two huge fuel tanks. Um, it's got some pumps that have to pump a huge amount of fuel and oxidizer into um, in a combustion chamber, and it's got control vanes. Uh, in the in the case of the uh, V2, is actually aerodynamic control vanes out in the out in the airflow and also inside the rocket exhaust itself. And then there's guidance and control devices up front, and there's a warhead, a payload, uh, something that goes bang, it delivers the bad news. Now this is a really inefficient way to to deliver bad news. If you think that you know. Now, the V2, which is the, uh, sorry, the Scud, which is kind of the follow-on of this, is less than a thousand kilo payload. Um, and you consider that the, uh, that the F-16 sitting at Misawa will carry twice that, that the North Korean Sukhoi Su-25s will carry three times that, and you can reuse them time and again. Now, of course, they have to be manned, they have to penetrate the uh, enemy's defenses and come back, and they have to be maintained, but they can be turned around. So, a, so a rocket, uh, a missile like this is a very inefficient way to deliver the bad news. If I was a North Korean operational planner, I'd, I'd be looking for a 40-foot container to put into Yokohama before I'd try to drop something in on the palace. Much easier, right? So what does a ballistic missile look like? Well, it starts off in the first stage boost. Um, it drops off the first stage. Uh, the second stage, it ejects a shroud. A shroud is simply an aerodynamic cover for the payload or whatever is on the, on the tip of the missile. Second, third stage uh, injection. This is uh, ignition and burn. Uh, this is pretty complex one. Uh, uh, 
reentry vehicle deployment, the, the bus, there's a separate bus with a separate guidance system. This is, this is like a Minuteman 3 or an SS-18. This is a very advanced uh, system where a whole lot of things have to go right. There's no, there are no surplus parts on any of these devices. Every single ounce that's wasted means you have less payload, and payload is what it's all about. And then you have to get back into the atmosphere, and the, the farther the distance, the greater the technical challenge of doing that. Which is why uh, Japan, if you go to Torre, one of the carbon fiber manufacturers, and you talk about certain fibers, and they're going the first question out of their mouth is, who's going to use it and for what? Because those technologies are very, very tightly controlled under the missile technology control regime, which includes any shipments to North Korea of anything like that. Um, and also to China and some other places. And then you have to fuse a device. Is it an air burst? And we can talk about that if you wish, or ground burst. So sometimes it's, it's difficult even for experts to tell the difference between a missile launch and a, and a uh, ballistic missile launch, sorry, a satellite launch and a ballistic missile launch. If you have the right data, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, ICBM is a military device, intercontinental ballistic missile, and they tend to accelerate very, very quickly. Uh, over 2 Gs per, um, uh, over 2.2 Gs to 3 G acceleration. Why? They're not worried about efficiency, they're worried about getting out away from the, from the launch site and getting away before the enemy can shoot them down, so they're very inefficient. They burn a lot of fuel getting out, and they want to get it out, get it fast, and, and get it. And it's interesting to see that the ICBM burnout is only at five, six hundred uh, kilometers from the point of launch. After that, it's on that ballistic trajectory. It, it will not be shot down. It can be intercepted. It can be broken so it doesn't perform its uh, function as planned, but it's not going to be you know, shot down. Um, whereas a satellite launch tends to sh go up at a, at a higher, sharper angle, pitch over, and then accelerate because it wants to insert a satellite so it will stay in orbit around the Earth at over 17,000 kilometers an hour. You know, say, so there, there are subtle differences, and if you have accurate enough equipment, you can actually tell the differences between a satellite launch and an ICBM launch. But you get a lot of useful data out of each one, right? So where are the North Koreans doing this? There's a, the, their primary spaceport is a place called Sohe. It's about 50 kilometers from the, from the Chinese border across the Yalu River. And there's a specific reason for this because they want to be able to fire east to west, uh, sorry, west to east across Korea and drop the first stage into the Sea of Japan. Um, the, what they've done recently, and you see in the news, is lofted trajectory. The lofted trajectory is the notion that uh, I have enough energy that I'm going to I'm going to take my spitball here and I throw it up and I can I can run tests and say I throw this up in a lofted trajectory. It's an unnatural trajectory, but if the most efficient trajectory, if I wanted to hit Fred in the head, uh, I would pitch it this way at almost a 45 degree angle. It's almost exactly a 40, and that's called the maximum efficient trajectory. So you can you can posit from the performance in a lofted trajectory the performance on a normal trajectory. Does that make sense? Okay, why? So why would they do that? Because once again, they're very limited in their options for tests and launches. Okay, so if North Korea fires north, the first stage of a multi-stage rocket is going to drop into China. The Chinese aren't going to like this, even though it's probably in the Korean Autonomous Zone where the first stage lands. Uh, some Chinese, it won't be upset about that, but maybe it lands in either China or Russia uh, if they were put into a useful North Polar orbit. So they're not going to do that. Uh, they, they can't go westward because um, the Earth rotates, as I'm sure you know, west to east, and at the at the uh, the most efficient trajectory to launch a missile to put a satellite into orbit is towards the east. Makes sense because you're essentially not moving at the north south poles. At the equator, you're going much, much faster. It's like 1,700 feet per second faster at the equator than the Earth spins here. So you want to shoot with the rotation of the Earth. Makes sense? But they're far north, so they can't really do that very efficiently. So if they shoot to the east where they want to test, then they can drop the first stage into the Sea of Japan and overfly Japan at a very high altitude, a very high speed, and the Japanese can't do anything about it. Legally, the question is, would they be able to do something about it? It's not even, a, we first have to establish, technically, can they do anything about it? The answer is no. If no one was there to tell the people of Hachinohe and uh, 
and da da te, hakodate, where they overflew in this last test, no one there would know it, trust me. I and mean, there was no way for anybody there to know it without the right radars telling them there's someone 600 kilometers up in the air and accelerating. Uh, it's just, so the, the Koreans were very, actually, uh, conservative in that sense that they thread the needle between the two uh, major uh, population centers of Sapporo and Aomori. And they actually went over the uh, Tsugaru Straits, which is about the least inhabited area in the whole uh, whole place, to drop, the, drop into the Pacific Ocean. Someone said, great success, we hit the ocean. Okay, so the question is how much accuracy, with, with what accuracy did they hit the ocean? They've never, they've never given an accuracy target. They're not testing that way. So no one knows how accurate these things are, including the North Koreans, unless they have have better instrumentation on those devices than I expect. So, turns out that from Sohei, they can actually have a useful southern polar launch that overflies Japanese waters and doesn't make, you know, really anger anybody except maybe the Filipinos if they think that it in, somehow violates their airspace. It's inconsiderate. It's, uh, it's quasi uh, against international convention, many, many space conventions, but there's really no international convention police, so there's nothing they can do about it. And the Filipinos won't know about it unless somebody tells them it happened, right? Okay, but the Earth is, in fact, uh, tilted on its axis, and we're talking here about um, how sat useful satellites in useful orbits have to proceed. So the next part is, when the North Koreans start talking about having a peaceful space program, what they're talking about is launching from North Korea over Japan. First stage is going to drop in the Sea of Japan. The second stage is going to overfly Honshu. And then the, the, then the uh, satellite, if it works, the, the second stage is going to continue to accelerate, and they're going to go south-southwest of Hawaii. This is physics. It's not politics. Okay. They can't help it. This is the only way they could get to a geosynchronous orbit. So they're either going to fire south or east. That's it. Right? So uh, this is why the United States, the, the, someone will say something silly and uh, they'll have some statements or whatever, but the, the actual response would be pretty, pretty muted because they'll be able to tell very quickly if it was a missile test or a satellite launch attempt. Okay, so how do the Chinese deal with that? They had the same problem, right? So what they do is they fire way out in Xinjiang and they drop it in the Bohai Sea, which is, which is uh, the, the northern um, um, portion of the, of the Yellow Sea there. Same sort of thing. They're firing to the east. They're using the acceleration of the Earth to make it longer, and they also control all those waters. Where does the first stage land? You don't want to be in certain villages in China when they do this. Now, from North Korea, all of the, all of this, the, the simple um, the trajectories, and you can take a globe. I don't have a globe. I have an NBA basketball from some, someone who was speaking some other time here. If you take it, you take a, a string, piece of string and you put your, uh, one end of the string on one place and put the next string, that is the most efficient trajectory. Then they can barely do that, so they're going to follow essentially the most efficient trajectories going towards their targets. Every single major target in the United States uh, lies uh, lies along these lines, and every single one of them overflies Japan except for Washington, D.C. Okay? And, and, um, and I actually had some interaction with Ambassador Sheffer many years ago where he was talking about, well, if you don't know where it's going, you should shoot it down. And I pointed out to him, if you, do, if you don't know where it's going, you're definitely not going to shoot it down because you have, to be, uh, you have to plan well ahead. You have to know exactly where it's going in order, to sh it, in order to engage any missile like this. There is no guesswork. There is no second chance because by the time you get there, if you're, if you're off by a tiny fraction of a degree, you're missing. So it's instructive to look at the, at the locations of the U.S. missiles that would engage these at a very high uh, latitude. So this is the route, uh, believe it or not, this is the, what uh, the ground trace of a, of a launch from Sohei to Washington, D.C. would look like. You get a flank shot from Fort Greeley, Alaska, where the, uh, uh, the ground, ground base interceptors, uh, the U.S., very large, very fast. Big rockets are fast. Fast rockets can be big. Uh, big rockets can be fast if they're done correctly. Let's put it that way. Okay, so they actually get a side shot from there and also from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is down here. So let me speed along. So when I was in the uh, U.S. military in Korea in 1979, we had a roughly uh, technological parity with the North Koreans. They had larger numbers, and we were very concerned about offenses uh, over the DMZ in the Seoul, and we spent a lot of time figuring out how we we're going to kill as many of them as we could. Uh, one of their big weapons, their big
biggest weapon at the time was a Frog 7, a free rocket over ground. It's an unguided rocket. It's actually spin stabilized. It comes out, it delivers bad news, 880 kilograms of high explosive with a, with a circular air of probability is not very good. Okay, so essentially it's a bomb, it goes off. Um, and this was the biggest thing they had. Now, last time I spoke in uh, the press club about this, almost 20 years ago, I think it was October 1998, talking about the Taipei Dong. Nobody knew what it was. The internet was in its infancy. So I came and explained that it's essentially all of these things are stacked up. Um, and the first stages of this are actually scud engines, which are kerosene and uh, nitric acid fueled uh, gizmos that were essentially developed in the 1950s. The, the final design was laid, laid down around 1962 or so, and has, has gone on from that. But essentially, if you, if you can imagine that, that a rocket is essentially is a giant rocket, is an, as empty as it can be because uh, all the rest of it is, is superfluous to the job of getting the, the payload to its intended p position. So you try to get the, the mass of the rocket is below 10% of the total weight of the rocket. So it's full. So these things are very, very strong in compression, right? So they try to build them. They, sometimes they have to build them out of steel if they're, if they're really fast. Um, other times they can actually build them out of aluminum. So a lot of these are actually aluminum alloy. And I've seen uh, missiles where you could actually put your, almost put your fist through the side of it. So these things are very strong in compression, but they don't work very well with tension. So you can't load this thing up with fuel and stand it up. So this is actually an outdoor factory, if you would, and they stack these pieces up, the, the different sections, stack them up, fuel them up, and then withdraw the tower and fire from there. So this doesn't sound like much of a terror weapon because you can see this going on for like three days. Okay, so so you can imagine that if if uh, these things were fueled and uh, and thought to be uh, carrying a nuclear weapon, that someone would would get off their duff and go do something about it. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the the Ministry of Defense, every every action officer, every operations officer I knew had a had a copy of a diet interpolation sitting on his desk, and they all had a tab on one from the 1950 mid 1950s interpolation with the with the uh, Director General of the, the Japan Defense Agency said, self-defense does not mean sitting here waiting for the blow to happen. Okay, And in the parliamentary system, this is a very important statement that has been largely forgotten for many, many years. Now, the Japanese uh, don't overtly talk about this, but you can imagine this device is very, very vulnerable. Um, in, in, and the fuels used are hypogolic, which means they explode on contact. So there's really nasty stuff Two different things that are nasty in themselves. When you put together, they burn. They ha require no ignition. They just ignite. And the fumes will ignite. So uh, many people have died figuring out how to make these things happen: fueling them, defueling them. Don't let you know. It's kind of like Ghostbusters. Don't let the streams touch. I mean, you don't want this stuff to touch because then it's all going to go off at once, and that's the end of you. Okay. So that's not very useful in a tactical sense. So what is useful in a tactical sense is a no dong, which is essentially a gigantic scud. If you look at here, uh, look at the range, 1,300 kilometers, and it's liquid uh, propellant uh, fuel, but it's a kerosene and, and fuming nitric acid, red fuming nitric acid mixture uh, that, that needs a starter. So it takes about like 45 guys to do this, and they got to do it right. And so the question is, of course, how, many, how well trained are they? You know, if Mr. Kim gets shot next to me, do I know how to make this thing work? And I've got to put in the 10 liters of starter fluid at the right place in the right valve and turn all the right valves. And this is pretty complicated. But the nightmare for Japan is that, the, that Tokyo is within range of this single stage uh, device that's, that's trundled around on a t transporter erector launcher, a TEL. And essentially, these are mobile launch pads. And then they followed around by uh, resupply trucks and gas, you know, trucks with kerosene, everything else. But the Musudan is a next generation device at very different range, three to 4,000 kilometers. Why? It's still liquid, it's still mobile, it's, it's actually weighs less than the uh, Nodong, but has a uh, lower, uh, lower uh, much greater range. So the, 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 the Nodongs, the scuds, are actually built out of a very, very hard, uh, very uh, dense material. They're very heavy, and they're made to bounce across the terrain and, and, and lift it up even while they're fueled. So the, the launch rates are very relatively small, and they set up a weather radar to tell them when anything's going. The Musudan is a, it was a first generation of a new uh, new series of North Korean rockets using a different fuel. Very nasty stuff. The
Then recently they came up with this one, which is a solid rocket fuel um, device, and it looks like this. It's, it's following Soviet practices, which is where they got the basic uh, technology. And some of it's a DF-1 from China, other Soviet, uh, old so Soviet technology. But essentially, this is, a, this is not the, the missile that you see. This is a protected, uh, sealed, uh, compartmented device. And the missile sits inside, okay? And by the way, uh, all of these things that show up in the, in the parades are not operational devices. There's kind of a cottage industry of people looking at these and understanding that the cables are all wrong and no two are quite alike. So they went to the lowest bidder and made a mock-up for the people. Um, but the real devices are never showed, and they wouldn't, you know, why would you put all your real devices in one parade? Thank you very much, they're the world's best target. Um, so what it looks like is this, it actually stands it up it's a solid fuel rocket, so it does, means you don't have to fuel it. It sits there, it's inert. If you do it correctly, it will store for years and years and years at, at ambient temperature. Uh, you put it on a, on a stand, essentially it, it lowers a, a big table, and it, it actually poops the rocket out of the, the storage cylinder, and then the engine kicks in. And if you're the right guy, you know, when I was when I was working in firing rockets and missiles, you know, I got a I usually got an attaboy. You didn't screw that one up. But if you're the guy, you get a big you know fan club all around you. you know, happiness and success are everywhere. Um, so we, once again, we talked about the lofted trajectory, what that means, how they're testing that, and how they can test it safely. They could probably could not hit the, uh, Japan with the first stage of one of these rockets if they tried. It just doesn't work that way. Okay. So these recent tests and these buildup of these tests since the beginning of uh, 2017 is showing a very, very high trajectory. Now, if you imagine that the International Space Station is down here below 400 kilometers over, over the Earth, these things are way out there. So they go very, very high, and they come down very, very fast. The question is, can they, can they withstand the heat of reentry? That's one of the myriad questions regarding this. So when they have this, the primary spaceport at Sohei, they're firing across the, uh, the, the Korean Peninsula and dropping the stages into, into the Sea of Japan. They used to actually, the North Koreans used to actually give uh, notice to airmen and seamen, uh, airmen and mariners is what's called NOTAM, and they send it off to the civil aviation authorities and say, don't go in this space for these number of days. And now they just kind of post it locally and like fishermen are supposed to avoid it. Once again, they've never said exactly where they're gonna drop these things. They give this huge blob, and yes, we hit the Pacific Ocean. How accurate is it? Who knows? They've also fired off the international airport. Now, if you if you think about all these launchers, there, tr the uh, transporter elector. Uh, transport erector launchers, the TELS, actually have wheels, which means it has a certain mobility. But North Korea only has about uh, 782 kilometers of paved road. Tokyo, the city of Tokyo has, Tokyo metropolitan area has over 28,000 my uh, 28,000 kilometers of paved road. So you could hide anywhere. You could pop in and out of a warehouse, run down the street. In North Korea, they only have a certain amount, and those are monitored very closely. So those wheeled vehicles have limited mobility, which is why this new solid fuel rocket on a track vehicle has gotten everyone's attention. That's, that's a scary one, okay? How accurate can these things be? This is SpaceX, if you followed uh, the space launch business. This is SpaceX actually putting uh, uh, the first stage on a barge, and that's a 50-foot ring in which the, the, the rocket landed. Now, this is a cooperative target. The target is telling the, the booster where to come. The booster is telling the target, I'm coming, reposition, make sure, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But if you can imagine that a, commercial, a U.S. commercial company could do this, that the U.S. has pretty good accuracy with its missiles. So what's on the missile? Um, I think most people understand that, that nuclear weapons come in a range of uh, flavors and technologies, um, and the most advanced of which is a thermonuclear warhead. This is a W87, which was the which is one of ten that went into the peacekeeper, the, the euphemistically named peacekeeper. Um, the peacekeepers were outlawed, but these uh, reentry vehicles are pr small cones, are only about this high, uh, truncated cone. It doesn't have any guidance, but the bus, the 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 last stage 
seeds that carried it could actually reposition and drop off these things at a, at a variety of targets. Under the arms limitation talks, uh, essentially these are going into the Minuteman three upgrades as a single warhead. So all these multiple, these MIRVs are coming out in these single devices. Now, this is a very complex device. There's a lot of miniaturization. There's a lot of electronics. In the event of the United States, it has like a dozen different uh, electronics. It's very highly classified, I'm assuming, a dozen. I can dream up a dozen. Smarter guys could probably think of two dozen interlocks and safeties. For example, there are some of these devices that don't work unless they're rotating at a very high rate of speed. The only way you get a big bomb to rotate at a very high rate of speed is with a rocket. And the rocket's got to be the right rocket. It's got to fire at a right angle. It's very strange. And, and we used to make those. So uh, there's all these interlocks. And now, do the North Koreans have all those? No. They'll be lucky to get it diffused, period. So one of the scary parts is getting, making sure that uh, not only does it work when you want it to work, it makes sure it doesn't work when you don't want it to work, okay? So the thermonuclear devices are very, are very complex, and they've only tested one or two. Um, they claimed one. It was actually not. It was, it was just a, 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 a tarted up regular nuclear device. But they did test one. It's, it's claimed to be a thermonuclear device. I believe it. Can they miniaturize it? This is a big if. Uh, this is really hard to do. Bear in mind the United, the United States has spent untold billions and billions of dollars testing, designing, manufacturing, and upgrading these devices over the years. They're very complex. Uh, so what is there to be done? about it. In, in South Korea, you have Patriot missiles. The United States has deployed THAADs. You have, um, and particularly for, since President Trump is in the area, you have aircraft carriers that can launch uh, uh, counter-strikes, pre-strikes. Uh, you have things like THAAD that can reach in the upper uh, reaches of the atmosphere or external to that. I was explaining to Mr. Varco earlier that the Patriots at, over at uh, the Ministry of Defense only have about a 20 kilometer slant range. That means that this it's got to get out 20 kilometers. That's not very far. I mean, we're talking about, and, not, and the missiles don't drop in on your head. They come in screaming off the horizon, like 22 and a half degrees over the Tanzawa mountain range. They come screaming past Iruma, past Yokota, coming towards the Ministry of Defense, and the Patriot would go up and intercept. It's a last ditch last-ditch effort at protection. Everything else, uh, the United States has strategic depth, so it can actually have, as I mentioned, the, the, the large interceptors at Fort Greeley and at Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'm not sure why this is there, but that shows once again that uh, Japan has a very different problem. If you look along the arc of defense, Japan has no strategic depth whatsoever. Okay, so it has a completely different problem from the United States. Um, it has no depth. It has to make decisions very early. I mean, early on, the notion that the, you know, the uh, cabinet ministry would be uh, advised in the event of a missile launch, and now they've gotten past that to a reality. They've given weapons free orders to, um, to uh, Asia ship commanders and things like that. There's no time to meet. There's no time for any of this. You've got to, you've got to react within seconds of this launch, which is why uh, both countries spend a lot of money uh, having launch indicator and warnings, things like that. Okay, uh, this is two rings that are overlaid to show that in fact most of Japan is uh, is uh, within range of these um, single stage. Uh, rockets, uh, these missiles, it's not, they are not in fact uh, very accurate that range. No one really knows what the accuracy of them are, although the, uh, apparently the North Koreans are now embarking on a, um, a program to increase the accuracy of their scuds and their no dogs, which is uh, actually more interesting to me, but much, much harder to explain than the ranges of themselves. The ranges are kind of apparent from looking at a rocket. You can tell from the outside of a rocket uh, often what type of fuel it has. You can tell by looking at the exhaust. Uh, whenever they fire these things, there are, there are aircraft that fly around and sniff the particles to make sure they understand what the, what the fuel being used is. You can tell from the acceleration. There are a lot of things you can tell from the outside. You cannot tell the accuracy until you try to drop it on something. Okay. So what does that mean? Uh, from, uh, let's say, somewhere behind the DMZ, fairly close uh, to, to the DMZ from South Korea, you're, you're just at 1,100 kilometers to Tokyo, downtown Tokyo. So it's like a nodong. 
uh, sorry, let's take a Scud, basic Scud, which has a 2.2 kilometer radius. If it could fire that far, it would, it would be 2.2 kilometers. This is called a circular error of probability. This means that uh, if I'm shooting baskets, I have a 50% chance of putting in the basket. And it says nothing about where the other 50% is going. So the other 50% could be out here, it could be in a room, it could be anywhere. That's if everything is working as planned. Now, the most accurate ones that they posit is about a uh, 500 meter uh, circular error of probability, which means that if I'm aiming at the palace, it's here. So the, the press club is right about here, I guess. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, in fact, many times I tell folks, probably the safest place you would be in the event of a North Korean missile attack is where they're aiming, because they don't know where it's going. Okay. So the question is, what do they really have? All of this, what do they really have? They've got these antiques that use kerosene, kerosene and fuming uh, uh, nitric acid. They're only useful tactically and can barely reach uh, Japan, and probably without much accuracy. They've got this new solid rocket. Um, I think this number is wrong. I think the, the range is much longer than that. But uh, this, is a, this is a whole new uh, level of readiness, and, and it can be fired with almost no preparation at all. Um, the, the no dong, sorry, the no dong here is essentially a, a souped up scud. You can't get any farther with this technology. It turns out that Tokyo is about the limit for this engine technology and fuel. The new fuels that they have, it's a uh, um, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrate, uh, hydrazine, dimethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, which is like a cleaning fluid. But the other stuff is really nasty. And the question is, there are only a couple of countries in the world that make this stuff, um, and China, Russia being those, and then do the Koreans make it themselves? I think they do. They think they have the technology. This stuff was mastered in the 1950s. It hasn't changed since then. There are more exotic materials. This stuff is really nasty. It's, it's very uh, carcinogenic. Uh, it requires special handling. As I say, you don't want it to get in contact ever because it burns on contact and explodes if there's enough of it. Uh, but they have changed uh, the game with using these new, and this is what they're focusing on now. Um, so I think the two to watch are this uh, solid solid fuel rocket, the uh, Puk Guk Song, and the uh, KN-14, which is also has another Korean name, which escapes me at the moment. Um, that's about it, and once again, the, the whole point is accuracy. When you send these things up, uh, reliability, accuracy, they think that they have a certain amount of reliability. I think that they have not demonstrated that. I think that they are, have, have demonstrated that they can do something, and once they got a success, they stopped, and they don't want to be called on this. Um, so it, it has always worked before. What's changed the equation? When they start saying we're miniaturizing a thermonuclear warhead and we're going to put it on there and we're going to blow you up and we're going to you know, use EMP to destroy all of your electronics. You think about waking up and none of your electronics work. None. Zero. Nothing works. Cell phones, towers, nothing works. Nothing works, nothing runs. Your car doesn't start. We all starve within a week or so. Okay? So this is pretty serious and they may have overplayed this. Um, but that's not my area of expertise. I'll leave it to your political pundits for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we go to questions and answers, starting with the working press only. Uh, as per usual, come up to the microphone, state your name, uh, state your affiliation if you have one, and only one question each, and no speeches, please. First up, Anthony. Anthony Rowley, <coughs> Singapore Business Times. Um, the obvious question most people ask is where is the North Koreans getting their technology from? <coughs> is it from the Ukraine or, or where is it from? And also, um, in intercepting missiles, um, does the chance of intercepting it successfully fall very greatly according to the number of missiles they fire? In other words, if they fire three at Tokyo, does that greatly reduce the chances of uh, hitting it? And finally, sorry, quickly, um, is the missile pre-programmed uh, to hit a target by computers, or is it sort of guided from satellites um, or, or some other way, en route it can be de deviated? Okay. Um, 
there, there appears to be some, a different definition of a single question, but I like this. Um, so where are they getting this technology? It's actually a very big mix. Uh, the original SCUD technology came in 1984 or so from the Egyptians uh, who had gotten um, SCUD missiles from the Soviets. Early, early version SCUDs, fairly short range, fairly limited. Uh, those have since been upgraded. They, uh, domestic upgrades, I mean, think about this. It's 1984, um, and it, the technology is 20 years old then, so they had to upgrade the electronics. As I mentioned, I believe, um, the, the United States and Japan actually used commercial ships to recover some of the first stages of the early missiles until the North Koreans started putting explosive charges in those. Um, after they had spent their fuel, they separated from the second stage, they blew them up in the air. So instead of a, of a, of a solid uh, booster falling into the ocean and being relatively easy to find, you know, a big, big aluminum thing at the bottom of, you know, a can at the bottom of the ocean, um, and they were watching very closely to see where those went. They blew them up so there's key pieces scattered all over, you know, three or four hectares. Uh, but those parts, the key parts were, in fact, um, U.S., Swiss, U.K., and I assume that many of the common electronics were Japanese, and they just weren't worth, worth mentioning in the reports that I read. Um, so the original technology, and I have actually had a chart showing how techno missile technology has flowed around the world. It was so complex that nobody would ever digest it, much less remember it. Um, so they got the original SCUD technology from the Egyptians. They've done a lot of work with themselves. They've also worked with the Iranians, apparently, trading uh, technology back and forth. Uh, this missile here... Um, sorry, Musudan. This is a 90, uh, R-27. This is a SS, SSN-6, a Soviet. Uh, this was 1960s technology developed um, by the Soviet Navy. They had a ground launch variant, but the Victor class submarines, which are essentially the Soviet Union's answer to the um, the Polaris, the first generation Polaris submarines. And if you think about it, the, the actual nose cones also look similar. The, the airfoil looks similar. Um, it's a essentially 1965 technology and it remained in service from 1968 to 1988. Uh, and it was upgraded several times to have increased accuracy. Um, so the, those engines have been apparently modified all through these stages of these missiles. Uh, there's a single single engine here, and there's a uh, apparently a twin engine here. Uh, what Mr. Rowley is mentioning with Ukraine, and there was one analyst who's a former Lockheed Martin engineer who works at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and he said it looks like an RD-250, which was a Ukrainian. Um, when, the, when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, it was uh, the manufacturing facility for these RD-250 engines, which were built for the Soviet military and shipped in the hundreds to the Soviet military. Uh, Ukraine had none. They didn't have any missiles that used the thing. Um, and it's also a twin engine. It's a very different design. I've seen an RD-250 myself. Um, and this is not an RD-250. It's much more plausible uh, that uh, this is, these are developments of the R-27 Soviet engine that the North Koreans have tinkered with for a long time and were able to modify that. So it's a single engine with a single tur turbo pump, and you don't change. It's not like working on your car, right? I mean, if I don't, if I got my car, I want to change the exhaust. I want to change the turbocharger. If I'm fairly handy, I can do that. These things, you don't put the wrong turbocharger on the wrong engine. I mean, you blow them up and nothing works. I mean, it's it's a night, it's an integration nightmare, integration testing nightmare. It's much more plausible, and that that report has been widely debunked. Um, and it, and the gentleman when he wrote it actually said. It could have come from this. It looks kind of like that. And it, it's interesting to me as I, as I see how technical stories evolve over the press, that it went from, it kind of looks like that to, it is that. Okay. Also, it's unconscionable that Ukraine, uh, which really wants to be in the good graces of the United States, would export this, this stuff to North Korea. It's just almost unthinkable. Uh, sorry, next question was. Um, Multiple launches. Uh, interception for multiple launches. Uh, once again, this is a numbers game, okay? If you can, uh, missile intercepts were never designed to 
uh, fight the Soviet Union, but was going to launch 12,000 ICBMs at the United States. It was never designed to do that. It was always designed for rogue states or someone, you know, uh, a non-state actor who somehow got a hold of a short-range missile, put it on a, put it on a cargo ship or whatever, uh, and and launched a missile or two. It was never designed for mass attacks. Um, it, it, so if you have, I mean, it's a simple, simple math equation. If you have a 99% probability of intercept of one, then you have less than a 99% probability of intercept of two. I mean, you just do the multiplication yourself. And only a limited number, these, these uh, missiles that I mentioned, uh, if I can find here. Uh, these missiles, they're only, they're like 50 total. Um, of these missiles, they're they're very few in number. Uh, so the the thought would be to in certain situations, there's certain scenarios where you see one one device coming, uh, you shoot two or three interceptors at it to to optimize your chances. But there's never a, a, a plan to do a wave of these. And the North Koreans don't have a wave of missiles. I mean, they're trying to put this. Um, uh, this this one missile on a submarine, and they ha might have one or two in the entire submarine, and they have one submarine. Let me tell you, this is the most sought-after submarine in history. When the war starts, the last place on the planet you want to be is in that submarine. Now, they're putting a lot of eggs in one basket, and, and they, there's no one that posits that as a first-strike weapon. It's not going to do it. It's going to be a second-strike weapon they would try to hide. Uh, and, and I guarantee you that my friends in the naval services of the you know, United States and Japan spend a tremendous amount of time knowing exactly where that submarine is at all time. And that's target number one. Okay, so you won't, you would not underwrite life insurance for those gentlemen. The guidance is entirely internal. This is one of the one of the issues of, of this sort of device. Uh, when I showed. When I showed this to SpaceX, the guidance is external. It, it's using GPS, it's using inertial systems, it's using a radio from this barge, which is named, of course, I still love you. If you like science fiction and Elon Musk, you'd know why. Um, so they're communicating. It's, it's a cooperative target. The, the barge is a target where the thing is going. The assumption is in the event of a military ICBM, ballistic missile launch, it's an uncooperative target. It doesn't want to be seen. So there, there's no plan to use GPS. Okay. GPS would not be accessible to the North Koreans anyhow because the high, the high accuracy GPS is not given to people like that. Uh, so they will use inertial guidance systems. In the event of most of these missiles, uh, this is, this is uh, stuff that no one talks about. Uh, good question. Um, and this is what I'm actually more interested in is the inertial guidance because I'm involved in a startup where we're going to replace the inertial guidance for some of these missiles with a solid state device. Right now, um, if, if you look at a Minuteman, uh, which is a strategic level device, it's a, it's a beryllium sp sphere that floats in a bath of Freon, uh, frictionless Freon, and it takes them a long time to make sure the Freon is up, they're spun up. It's, it's a uh, gyroscopes, three gyros, physical gyroscopes, and they're initialized. They are told exactly where they are and where they're going. Okay, So once they start, uh, as long as it's under power, then, they, then the inertial guidance system is giving guidance instructions to the missile to nudge it one way or the other. Once, once the power is gone, once the, the missile's out of power, then, then it's on a ballistic trajectory. So if you think about the accuracy required for the first few seconds of that for the missile to go on, um, in the event of a SCUD, they actually have the, the, the textbook was um, that the SCUD, you had to survey, they have a pre-survey point, so North Korea knows where they would fire these things from. So they know exactly where, they're, where they are. Um, they spin up the inertial system, which physically takes time. I mean, you have to get these gyroscopes spinning, everything has to check, and then you tell it where to go. But they also had a very special weather radar that they set up. Why? Because if this missile is going up and there's a big crosswind at this altitude this way and another crosswind at this altitude this way, it makes a tremendous difference at, at the uh, range of six or 800 kilometers, just a couple of degrees. Big difference. Well, guess what? In the, Ara in the Iraqis learned real quickly not to turn on the bloody weather radar. Radar because it was a very singular display and everybody in a fighter was trying to kill a scud would take out the weather radar and everybody with it. So they started shooting these things without any weather data. Of course, you, if you had a distributed weather system, you could use um, static weather 
data. I mean, they may use the Japan Meteorological Agency for all I know. And they would not turn on this weather radar. Also, the, the Soviet doctrine was it took like 30 minutes to dismantle all the Scud launcher and everything and decamp the place where they shot. Well, the Iraqis got, you know, so, so the entire U.S. military and the coalition figured out, we, we're going to go get these guys and kill them within 10 minutes. Well, the Iraqis realized that they could go push the button and then abandon half the equipment. And they were gone within four or five minutes. And so that's why the, the anti-SCUD operations, the uh, ex post facto anti-SCUD operations uh, d let, met with only limited success because the Iraqis threw out the Soviet rule book and left half their equipment and just beat feet because they knew they were going to die if they stood around to pile all this stuff into the truck. Um, and then, uh, so that's guidance interception. That's it, right? Is that good? That's a nice Todd. <laughs> Worse than you thought. <laughs> yes, sir. My name is Crowell. I'm with uh, Freelance. My question is, you would ex I would expect that the U.S. Navy or somebody is trying hard to locate and bring up the warheads that fell into the North Pacific, as they've uh, discovered it, uh, submarines and brought them uh, sunken submarines and brought them to the service. Would it be it possible to uh, <coughs> bring up these uh, d warheads to study? Or is it not quite worth the trouble it would take? Well, um, I, I take it what you're asking about is the, is the uh, what were presumably development test where they overflew Honshu and landed. Well, the, first off, for me, the, war, the term warhead is a misnomer here because there was no warhead. They would not put an operational warhead in a test rocket. Uh, first off, it's a huge expense, uh, and you would not run the risk of exactly that, the U.S. Navy or someone recovering these warheads. I'm, I'm certain that there was an effort to locate the reentry vehicles, which would be the capsule carrying the warhead, but it was, a, everyone assumes they were dummies. Uh, heavily instrumented, perhaps, to provide um, telemetry to, downlink telemetry to some fishing boat or trawler out there trying to get information, because without that information, they have no idea what happened. They would not know their accuracy, they would not know where it was going. So they would try to instrument them as much as possible, and they would try to get that data. Now, everybody's out there intercepting this data. There are people who live for this. Now, once the, once the reentry vehicle has hit the ocean and gone to the bottom of the ocean, I would expect there's somebody out there poking around trying to find it to see what it looks like. Um, but they're not going to find an, an operational warhead in there as such. So it's just like, um, you know, if, if, if I'm training you to use hand grenades, we're not going to start with live hand grenades, right? We're going to start with toe poppers or, you know, flashbangs or something that goes pop. It feels right. It looks right. It gives you the right experience, but it's not going to blow us up. We're going to start with a dummy. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, not a warhead, but the reentry vehicle, absolutely. There's someone looking. Now, the North Pacific is a much deeper place than the Sea of Japan, and it's a much bigger place. So I don't know if they've had any success. And, you know, governments being governments, uh, they would lie like hell. Um, they, they would say, we didn't find it. If they found it, if they found it, they would say, we didn't, you know, what's, what's true? They would not want to tip their hand about it. the technical, uh, technical intelligence. It's a very big deal. It is a very, uh, very, very big deal. You want some interesting reading, go to the CIA archives that have been declassified, where in the 1950s and 1960s, they talk about their assessment of Japan's ability to build um, ballistic missiles. And, and people have been doing that sort of technical intelligence a long time. So yes, sir. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Um, Alistair Gale with the Wall Street Journal. Thanks for doing this. Um, you mentioned EMP. Yes. Uh, this seems to be uh, something that divides um, experts in their assessment of how likely it would be for the North Koreans to attempt that. Skeptics say that if they've got a nuclear warhead, why detonate it in space? Why not just deliver it to target? Um, and, you know, if you were to attempt an EMP attack and you couldn't be sure of the, the impact of that, you might be, leave yourself open to devastating counterattack. What's your view on 
um, the likelihood of the North Koreans um, seeing an EMP attack as, as, as something that they would uh, try in a, in a conflict situation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good question. Uh, EMP for us uh, great unwashed is electromagnetic pulse. Uh, when, thermo, when, when anything goes, actually a conventional explosion uh, goes off, there's, a, there's an electromagnetic pulse across a very broad range of radio frequencies. And uh, so, so we see the light uh, the heat, we feel the heat, um, you'll feel the concussion, that's a sound wave, it's, a, it's a, not electromagnetic, but it is also an impulse uh, as the energy is converted from stored chemical energy. So, the, so what occurs with thermonuclear weapons in particular, they're very, very big, first they're very big and they're of a certain type. Uh, and what the United States found out by accident, if you detonate these things at the right altitude in the ionosphere, they tend to propagate across, uh, across very wide and fairly unpredictable um, ranges. Um, it just, just so happens that uh, I helped on the technical side of uh, Bradley Martin's new book, uh, Nuclear Blues, um, and where we were free to posit that anything they wanted to do would work and it would work to deadly effect. Um, part of this is, is the, part of the question is, okay, let's take it backwards. Let's take it from a technical standpoint. First off, detonating at a high altitude is much easier than detonating at a, a normal airburst. So a normal airburst for a nuclear weapon over the palace would be maybe a few kilometers high. So essentially you want the fireball to not interact with the earth. So you, you don't want to bring up all the debris and create the giant mushroom cloud. You want a big flash and you know, burn a lot of people. Um, so that's an airburst, but it's a very low altitude. So in order to go to the United States, remember it's like 10,000 kilometers. So the energy to get it up to the point where it's gonna re-enter the 10,000 kilometers, it doesn't go up uh, arithmetically, it goes up uh, as a much higher function. The energy that coming back in, it turns out that the re-entry is one of the harder things about ballistic missiles, long-range ballistic missiles. This is why phenolic resins, Carbon, carbon fiber, the, the materials that make up these re-entry vehicles are very, very, very tightly controlled. Um, they're, first off, they're incredibly expensive, they're hard to work with, and, and you, can't, you, know, you can't buy them at the local hardware store. You, like I say, you ask any legitimate company about this, they'll, not, they'll first off, who's going to do what with it and show me in proof that your government uh, is behind us. So, if you detonate at a very high altitude, you're not in the denser part of the atmosphere, so your heat, lo your thermal loading is very, very low. So technically, there's actually an advantage to doing this. That's the scary part to me. There's actually an advantage, and they have to, in order to have a precise missile that comes in for a ground burst or an air burst over the palace, it's got to come in through the atmosphere, and there's a tremendous thermal loading. And, and guess what? The, the thermal loading kills the electronics, which make the thing go boom. Uh, it's the radar and everything else that's put into these warheads. So there's actually, in a technical sense, there's actually an advantage to doing it at a very thin, high altitude in the ionosphere. Now, Separately from that is, will it work? Because um, for someone to try this against the United States with the U.S. dependence, and, or Japan, someone uh, in Europe, a strategist, recently asked me, what is Japan doing about electromagnetic pulse protection? I said, how about zero? It's not going to happen. They don't think it's going to happen. Um, but if you can imagine the society here with nothing electronic, I mean, it, it, that's an exaggeration. So your 57 Chevy with condenser and points is going to start. But your 2015 Mazda with electronic ignition is probably not going to start ever again. You're going to have to replace all of the, all of the uh, computers and controls. So this is a, this is a tremendously... Uh, um, scary prospect, let me tell you. Uh, it, it, part of it is the great unknown because the tests were so hard, it wasn't something that the United States could do on a regular basis because it was so irregular. It's like lightning strikes. You know, you can kind of encourage lightning to strike the lightning rod, but it might go next door and hit the window. I mean, it's, it's really, um, there's a lot of science behind it, but it's not a predictive science. It's a descriptive science, I think, is, is a fair way. I may be wrong. Um, so, on the one hand, it's actually technically easier to detonate 
at that high altitude because you don't have to penetrate all that deep atmosphere and fuse more precisely. You've, you've eliminated that problem. Um, politically, it's, I mean, it's a huge step, right? You're, you're trying to take down a society. And which is why, one, once again, just a, this prospect, and it's not a, a regular nuclear weapon's not going to create that much of a problem. It's a, it's the larger thermonuclear weapons, the two two stage devices that create a blast large enough to have a, a, a deleterious effect on ground electronics. Th think of taking down the grid. No subways work. You know, it's a problem. So I don't know. But this is one. This is one of the reasons I think that North Koreans have about over politically about overplayed their hand. Uh, this is a new game. When they start putting all of those elements together and someone says, hey, you could do an EMP in the high atmosphere, all of a sudden, a lot, of pe a lot more people get worried than we're worried about me and you getting blown up with a, you know, a 400 ton, 400 pound, 400 kilo high explosive. I mean, it, that's an inconvenience for us, but it's not, it's not uh, taking down the society. Um, just following up on that, uh, we were talking in the anteroom about how the U.S. may use an EMP against North Korea. How, how valid is that? Uh, how valid? Yeah. How, how likely is it, or how? Oh, I think that I think that if the United States takes kinetic action against North Korea, they're going to unveil things that that people cannot imagine. Um, and you can you can Google. Um, CHAMP, C-H-A-M-P. It's a U.S. military EMP program. Uh, I think the prime contractor was Boeing. It was essentially put an a electromagnetic pulse bomb inside a cruise missile to go over and take out um, the power grid of a city or command and control of anything. Um, and so all the modern electronic, you know, once again, these the, the actual test, I mean, it depends on, uh, it's, it's kind of erratic. Um, it flows along power lines. Uh, uh, it doesn't flow along rivers. I mean, there are all kinds of strange things things that start happening. But uh, the U.S. has already said, yeah, we have these things in inventory. And that's all they'll say. They've been tested and we have them in inventory. So they have an electromagnetic pulse weapon in inventory. And it's an un unmanned cruise missile. So I would think that uh, conventional war with North Korea would become the technologist's uh, playground. They're going to throw everything at the North Koreans. Now that's the nightmare. The only thing that works in North Korea is the government. And if the government doesn't work, there's no food for the people. Nobody has any food stocks. You know, half the population doesn't have electricity. They have no food on hand. They go to work in order to get food from their work unit. When the government starts stops working, the, the military and the government stops working, then you get 25 million refugees. What are you going to do with them? Is that about right? Oh, sorry, that was you. So yeah, if, if you, you can imagine if the United States says, we have this, what are they saying? What are they not saying they have? Do they have artillery? You know, do they have smaller devices? Um, it's going to be a playground for the people who just you know, want to use everything against them. Uh, uh, Takashi Koyama, freelance. So can you say the North Koreans have developed a miniaturized nuclear weapon, or would you rather say they are still uh, in their testing stage? I would, I would not say they have developed one. I, I will say they have said they are developing one. Um, how hard is that? Like I say, the, it, you can look through the, the history of uh, engineering development and testing for missiles and, and nuclear weapons. It took the United States a long time, a lot, of, a lot of testing to make miniature nuclear weapons, some of which I can carry on my back, um, some of which will fit inside a 155 millimeter, 155 millimeter diameter artillery shell. And I can, I, I mean, it's heavy, but I can pick it up. And I can't move it very far. Two man lift, we can do it. Um, have they done it? Uh, I don't think so. I think if the United States actually believed that they had miniaturized these things, we would be well far on our way towards not much more talk. Because of the th if, if they had miniaturized it and miniaturized the uh, uh, reliable fusing of these devices and put that all together, that, that we would be a lot closer to bang, bang rather than jaw, jaw. Um, so I don't think that's the case. 
Um, and like I say, this is part of them kind of over, the, the rhetoric has been pretty much overheated. Um, I, I think it will go down. You know, it, it, people make mistakes. Saddam Hussein went to the gallows and he believed he had a nuclear weapons development program. Why? Because the guy that he put in charge knew that if he told him he didn't have one, he'd be killed. So Saddam Hussein went to the grave convinced he had a nuclear weapons development program that just wasn't pushed far enough. Um, he, the, the day before the, the coalition invaded, Saddam, he, Saddam Hussein told his generals, I don't have mountains of chemical weapons. And this is what you know, the popular press people tend to forget, is that Saddam Hussein had been telling his entire inner circle, and they had been basing all of their war plans on the fact that they had mountains of chemical weapons. And like two days before the coalition kicked off, Saddam Hussein said, you re remember that, right, right? It, it's not true. And they all said, but our entire defensive plan is based around these weapons. Well, they don't exist, so do something else. Okay, so people make huge, huge mistakes. Um, I, I wonder if this will go down in history as someone making a big mistake. I hope it's them, not us. Yep. Uh, we're over time at the moment, but we have uh, Lance said he can stay a little bit longer, uh, maybe another five or ten minutes. <laughs> I think for a little freelancer from Germany. Right. Germany. Uh, if the North Korean don't know what happens in the re-entry phase, how is it possible to develop, to, to manage this process of uh, re-entry and to have a, uh, uh, this, this develop this kind of security uh, shield and further? Right. Well, um, it, this is one of the one of the uh, interesting aspects of having an open society. Um, and if you if you read between the lines, not even read between the lines, you look at the recent uh, direct pronunciations of people who were in the Trump White House, and they briefed Trump on the on the massive Chinese uh, intelligence programs uh, strip mining the United. Forget the cyber attacks. I mean, the cyber attacks are easy. You know, the Chinese essentially ran the internet system of one of the major Japanese defense manufacturers for 18 to 24 months. I mean, they, they stripped everything they could out of that. Um, and, they're, and they're attacking everything in the Western world. Um, they, they have uh, an incredibly uh, well-funded, uh, well-motivated human intelligence network going after technical intelligence in the United States. There's a, there's a lot of uh, general information uh, available in the United States, it helps them shortcut a lot of that. Uh, it's an excellent question, but you you see this tiny, uh, fragile economy that spent a lot of money on advanced manufacturing equipment, uh, mixers. I mean, these these like these solid rocket motors are coming out of nowhere to build these giant solid rocket motors. If they've actually built them themselves, it's really hard, and you screw it up, and a lot of people die. I mean, they they, they tend to go bad in one way only: they blow up. They don't they don't burn correctly. They blow up. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, it's a gigantic stick of dynamite that's kind of controlled explosion. And if anything goes wrong, everybody dies, the missile dies. So how, how do they do that? That's a good question. And so a lot of people are looking at, um, looking at their equipment purchases, looking at where people are going to school, looking at what they're, uh, probably looking at what they're accessing on the internet. Um, the Chinese have, uh, you know, the tens of thousands of students in the United States. I mean, I'm told these days you wake up in an aerospace engineering class and there's no Asians in the room, you're probably actually in English class. Um, they're all over the place. They're strip mining the United States. This is part of the discussion that's being held, presumably now, between uh, uh, Trump and uh, uh, Premier Xi. Um, how do you do that? Uh, you can only do so much modeling. Right, so you can you can do a lot of modeling. I can do the basic modeling on my home computer. It kind of tells me it's a bazillion megajoules per you know square centimeter of heat loading, and what do I do with that? You've got at some point you have to test, and that's why I'm saying I think they're overplaying their hand. They haven't tested any of this. Um, this is why, uh, as you ask, someone's trying to recover that to see are they making any strides. Like I said, this is actually one of the harder things, and and if you actually see one of these reentry. Uh, 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 vehicles, it's essentially a, you know, it's a 
it's not, they're not even very nicely made. I mean, they're kind of wrapped in uh, carbon fiber and kind of clunky looking, and they, and they come zipping in. They've got a certain shape that keeps it aer aerodynamically stable because there are no fins or engine or anything. It's just, it's, it's just a dart. So, um, you know, you've got to have a mock. 10 uh, wind tunnel, and there are only like two of those on the planet. So you, you actually have to do it, or you have to model it and work in the laboratory correctly. That's the question. So it, this is another reason that it goes back to the question of the EMP. Maybe it's easier just to explode in the upper atmosphere. They can do that. They can, they can survive that much thermal loading to get into the upper reaches of the atmosphere, hit the ionosphere. Can they drop it into a kilometer over the, over the palace? I don't think so. Maybe at the range of Tokyo, but once again, it's, a, it's not an arithmetic uh, function. It's a, it's a log function of how much thermal loading there is if they go to the other side of the planet. It's really hard. Does that answer your question? Half a, okay. <laughs> Uh, uh. Make it quick. A quick half question, quarter question. I think that uh, for the North Korean, it's a, it's a uh, you're learning by by doing on and and how to to see that if the, your failure, you can learn from your failure. Oh sure. But if you if the uh, the, uh, the the warhead or a warhead dummy comes down and they don't find it, how can they learn? <laughs> If, if, if the reentry vehicle plops into the ocean, yeah. how can they learn? Well, they put, uh, well, you, uh, you put instruments on it and then you use a radio to transmit the data from the device. That's why I mentioned earlier uh, heavily instrumented test equipment. Um, so, so everybody, you know, the Russians were out there, the Chinese were out there. Anybody that knew what they were up to was out there trying to uh, get those signals to figure out what they were doing. I mean, you actually may have American engineers who understand what they did better than the North Korean engineers did. So they would try to instrument that. It's, it's worthless otherwise. Except as a demonstration. Is it a demonstration of our will versus a demonstration of our technology and a developmental test? And you, you would only know from the inside. Okay. I'll go with the final question very quickly. Uh, we titled this speech uh, Bombs or Bomb Blast. And basically, North Korea seems to be trying to con the West into believing that they have better we weapon systems than they do. Do you think the West is being conned, or do they understand what's going on? To a significant, significant degree, uh, these demonstrations can be political demonstrations, they can be technical demonstrations. Um, they're also uh, trading information with other people doing the same things, the Iranians, for example. The, the, the ill-named uh, Axis of Eagle was, in part, uh, engendered by the recognition that these uh, people were trading technology back and forth for nefarious purposes and, and essentially violating all the uh, international uh, technology control regimes and everything else. Um, I, I think that there's, there's definitely some, there is a there there. They have done something, in which in, in some ways as an engineer I, I find very admirable with very limited resources against all the sanctions in the world. They've been able to take something that's 50-year-old you know, uh, Soviet technology they probably had to replace every single part. Um, and actually clues this thing together and, and come up with a rocket. Um, the scary part is what's the guidance and the reentry? Uh, can they actually guide it to a significant degree? You know, how accurate is it? And then can they get the, the reentry vehicles in? Um, I, th I think they may have well overplayed the hand with this administration. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no time for any more questions, I'm sorry. Uh, we want to thank Lance for coming and giving this very informative speech. And as is customary here, we will give him a one-year honorary membership and hope he comes back again. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope it was of utility.